Well, good evening, everyone. I would say turn to such and such passage in your Bible, but we're going to be all over the place. Uh, tonight we're going to try to cover five weeks, or not five weeks, that would be amazing, uh, five days of camp uh, in uh, approximately about 25 to 30 minutes. Uh, if we can do that, it'd be great. Uh, I want to go ahead and begin, however, by kind of pointing out one of my favorite things about camp. When we go there, <clears throat> we interact with uh, our, our young folks, and one of the things that I, I always like to see, and one of the things that I take uh, kind of great joy in, is when our young men will come up to myself, or will come up to another one of the teachers, and I saw Dennis uh, talking to some, and Philip, and Glenn, and uh, lots of the guys were talking to some of these young men about, I want to do a lesson, but I really don't know what to say. I have this idea in mind, but I don't really know where to go to kind of get these things all together and in one place. And there were at least a couple of occasions in which that happened to me throughout uh, the week, and it no doubt happened to some of our other you know, male count, count, counselors, uh, and no doubt our female counselors as well. One of the things that uh, the ladies do uh, and the young women do in their cabins is they give devos as well. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, some of our leading ladies, some of our counselors in those cabins, they're helping them uh, with those things uh, as well, getting together those lessons, delivering those things, learning how to say prayer, uh, and so on and so forth. So across the board, we're, we're teaching them how to do these things and putting the Bible in their hand and showing them, in some cases, what the books are, where they are, Old Testament, New Testament, how many there are, because a lot of uh, the kids uh, that we get uh, come from very, very different backgrounds. Some of the kids that have been coming for years came from places where really they didn't go to church. Mom and dad just really didn't know exactly what to do with them for the summer, so they send them to camp, and somehow they found out about Weeki Wachi Christian uh, camp. Uh, I know this year, in, in our cabin alone, uh, we had uh, not just uh, kids from the Churches of Christ, but we had one, uh, <clears throat> one uh, uh, young man who, who uh, grew up uh, Catholic, uh, and to this day uh, is Catholic, but I know that in our cabin, uh, we kind of challenged some of the thinking uh, that uh, as part of that system of belief and uh, in a kind way, uh, in a loving way, based on questions that he asked uh, us. I know we had another folk, uh, another fella, a uh, young man uh, from a either Baptist or Presbyterian uh, background. So they come uh, and they have all these questions and they have all these things and they ask us for help. Uh, well, there was one young man <clears throat> who came to me uh, and uh, he asked me for help and I said, sure, I'd be glad to help with you. Show me what you have, and we'll work with that, and we'll kind of move forward. Uh, and this fellow pulled out three sheets of paper with this very neatly written uh, and well-organized outline. And the reason why I'm telling you is because tonight, the lesson I'm giving you is his outline. Uh, it's his outline. And at the end of it all, and after he explained to me what the, he wanted to do, I said, you know, I wrote the notes. And I said, I never thought of that outline. And I try to think of it from several different ways. Try to approach the topic from several different perspectives. And he had this great outline. It started off with an idea that was fostered by him sitting in the chapel service. And I can't remember who was giving the talk at the time, but they were talking about family. And he said a thought occurred to him. You know, everybody is born into a family. And actually, this is the last day's lesson. The last day's lesson that we had was family. The days prior to that, well, I'll explain in just a minute. But he was sitting in the chapel service and he said, you know, everybody is born into a family and you can't always, you know, well, you, can't, you can never help what family you're born into, right? We don't have that choice. You know, we're, we're born and we're helpless and we're raised and we're brought up in the family that we're brought up in. But all of us have that family and none of us really have that choice, you know, in our family. By the same... <clears throat> excuse me, by the same token, none of us really have the choice by virtue of our use to pick the community that we live in. And that was one of our points too. How do we engage with family? How do we engage with community? So this young man said, well, I was born into a family. And then by virtue of being in that family, we lived in a community. And I got to know the people in my community. And from that community, I grew close to some people. And I called those people friends. So my first contact with people in this world is my family. Those family, the family introduces me to my community. And in that community, 
I find these people called friends. And the Bible has a lot to say about friends, and we'll go through some of that in just a, a moment or two. But then he went on to say, but there, and at that point, something critical changes. You see, you can't always help the family that you're brought up in. You may not be able to choose the community that you live in, but you can choose the friends that you have. And the friends that you have will make a difference in the other two areas that we talked about. You see, because if you choose the right friends and you choose the right influences, and they are people who are interested in godly things, or really what we're talking about, people who are fully tapped into the reality of this world. Because the simple fact, it'll come out, simple fact of the matter is that we live in a world that is created by God. And he designed it in a certain way. And by virtue of that fact, certain things are the case. And it's Christians, and Christians only, fully practicing and fully engaged with God, that understand that reality. Now, that may sound kind of harsh, but that's the truth of the matter. So if we get ourselves involved with the right friends, then those right friends will introduce us to the body, Christ's body, over which he is the head. We call it the church. And in that church, we find God. And we find ourselves truly engaged with the creator of this world. With the one who, by virtue of his great power, moves us and sustains us and helps us and guides us. Lights our path. Makes everything peaceful and joyful in this world, despite the turmoil and chaos at times. So this young man presented this outline to me and I thought, you know, that's a profound idea. But then I also thought, you know, he did it exactly backwards of the way I did it. But you know, I kind of liked his idea a little bit better and I told him that. We don't choose the family all the time. We don't choose the community, but we can choose our friends. And with groups of kids like this, really emphasize that point. It's very important who you put yourself around. It's very important who you allow to influence you. Someone once said that, you know, if you want to know what you'll be like in five years, just look at the five people who are around you. Because you'll end up just like them. Are they strong, engaged Christians? Then they'll lead you closer to God. They'll lead you closer to God. But those are the five topics that we talked about. The idea of being engaged. <clears throat> we kind of drew the parallel between the idea of being engaged with all of these ideas to driving a car. Driving a car. You, you can get in the car and you can sit in the car and you can, like a, a small child, sit there and turn the wheel and make noises with your mouth, but you're never going to go anywhere that way, are you? So it's not enough to just simply be in the car. That's not being engaged. That's being near something that has the power to engage, but that's not actually being engaged. Now you can get in the car, you can put the key in the ignition, and you can actually start that car and then sit there and listen to it hum and waste a whole lot of gas and run the battery down and so on and so forth, and that doesn't get you anywhere either. You can get in the car, you can start the ignition, you can take that gear shift and you can throw it in neutral. And then one of two things is going to happen. You're going to drift forward, you're going to drift backward, and the car is going to be running, but you're not going to be really in control of it because you haven't put it in gear. Or you can get in the car, you can fire up the ignition, and you can put that car in gear and then get it down into reverse and go the opposite direction that perhaps you need to be going. You know, this kind of thing happens all the time. You, you hear this. When I was a kid, there was a big Catholic church in our town. The town I grew up in, St. Clairsville, Ohio, was predominantly Catholic. And they were all the time doing renovations uh, of their building. It was probably about my junior year in high school that they renovated the front of their building. It was a massive renovation. Massive renovation. They, they tore out pretty much the whole front of the building and created this, I don't know, for lack of a better word, it almost looked like they turned their foyer into a greenhouse. I mean, it was pretty much all windows. At the same time, they terraced their parking lot. Because St. Clairsville, well, it sits on the top of a hill. And you can't really find a street that is flat. 
So they terrace their parking lot. Well, one Sunday morning, and a particularly populated day at the Catholic Church, an elderly woman put a car in gear, stepped on the pedal, figured out very quickly it was in reverse, but not knowing what to do and panicking, she pushed the gas pedal harder. So much for the glass foyer. Drove right through it. Fortunately, nobody was injured. But that's what we get when we go in reverse. We end up in places that we don't want to go. So to be engaged in God means that you're not only in the right place, you're not only behind the right power, but that you've got the car fully in gear. To be fully engaged is to be like well, what Christ said. In this position where you are giving your all to God, now to love the Lord with all thy what? Heart, mind, soul, in a couple of different passages say it a different way, soul, strength. In other words, all of who you are. We've got to be in that position where we are saying, you know, I'm crucified. Christ is in me. My life is dedicated to him. I am living wholly for him. That's what it means to, to be engaged. Now, a lot of things are going to spread out from that idea. And number one, it means that I'm not only a listener of his word, but I'm a doer uh, of his word. So I can't call myself engaged. I can't say that I love him with all my heart and mind and soul and strength if I'm not taking the things that he gave me in his written word and actually applying them in, in some sense. That's what it means to be engaged. To live your life fully for God. Now the passage that we used to kind of demonstrate that idea, the theme verse for the week was what? Dennis knows. I know Dennis knows it. Second Chronicles, right? Second Chronicles 16, 9. Anybody say it? Bryce, you remember it? Boom. Nailed it. Between the two of you, you got it exactly right. The eyes of the Lord. Look to and fro all over the earth, searching for those to strongly support whose hearts are completely his. That's engaged. God sees and God knows. So down to the very motives of what we do, we are engaged with God. Now then we broke these lessons out into five different categories. And the first thing that we talked about was getting engaged with God. And the first point that we made very simply was this. And I asked the students in class, and they looked kind of befuddled at first, and they didn't really know how to answer because I, I don't know that they've ever, ever been asked. I simply asked them the question, do you think God is fully engaged with you? And they kept wanting to give these answers. Well, when I study, or you know, when I do, and I'm like, that's not what I'm asking. I'm not asking about what you do. Do you think God is fully engaged with you? And eventually we got around to the right idea. And the answer, of course, is yes. God is fully engaged with you. 100% God is engaged with you. Now, look at, look at what we have that tells us that God is engaged with us. Let's kind of work backwards. Go to the book of Revelation. Everybody remember that passage about Jesus standing at the door knocking? Remember that? He stands at the door and he knocks. And he waits for what? Yeah, he waits for us to open the door, right? Well, that's kind of this picture that we're trying to paint. You see, God sent his son, <clears throat> sent his son to deliver a message, to be a sacrifice, to open the door to the salvation that God offers. Now, kind of go backwards in the Bible just a, a little bit. And you can look at all of the different ways that God is actually knocking on your door, telling you, I want to be engaged. I want to be engaged. I want to be engaged. He tells us through Paul, pray without ceasing. Always have the mindset to pray. Always be willing to communicate with me. Always be willing to, to make your needs and your wants, your desires, those things that you're struggling with, known. That's God telling us that he wants us to be engaged with him or that he is actually engaged with us fully. He tells us, study show that, to show thyself approved, right? 
Well, if there's no word to study, then that's kind of impossible. God gave us his word. And the giving of that word. Now, and it's not just the giving of the word, right? It's the giving of the word through all of the different men, throughout all of the different ages, placed in the hands of men, preserved throughout history, so that you and I can read it today in our own language. Folks, that's the providential, powerful working of God. That's God wanting to be engaged with you. I mean, there's a reason why, and it's not coincidence, that hundreds of years after we have found documents, we have constructed what we know as the Bible, that we can find things like the Dead Sea Scrolls, read them, compare them to what we have today, and they match up perfectly. You see, because God's designing that. And that's God telling you, I want you to know what I think. I want you to know my thoughts. That reminds me of another passage in the book of Isaiah. It's a passage I think sometimes we, we kind of put a, not a wrong twist on, but, but perhaps one that leads us away from the main idea. You, you remember Isaiah in Isaiah 55? He talks about, my ways are not your ways, nor my thoughts your thoughts. And one of the things that we always say about that passage is, well, you know, we're not going to understand everything, of, you know, of God. Because he's up here and we're down here. And that's certainly true. But that passage is surrounded by verses that say, seek me while I might be found. Call upon me. I will hear. Try to understand, in other words, my ways. Try to understand my thoughts. I don't think Isaiah is giving us the word of God to say, I'm high, you're low, I'm superior, you're inferior, you can't know, you can know. He's saying, right now, your thoughts and your ways are not close to me. You need to seek me. You need to make that more so. You need to change that. Reminds me of another passage in Isaiah, Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59. You remember, <clears throat> and uh, I challenged the kids with this one too, and see how many could remember from the previous year, because it was one of our verses then. God's hand is not shortened that it cannot what? Save. His ear is not heavy that it cannot, but what? Your iniquities have separated you from God. See, God's willing to hear you. God's there and he's waiting. He's got the hand ready. His ear is ready to hear. But you see, it's your sin that keeps him. And that's that door. That's that door that we need to swing outward and get rid of. So that he can come into our heart. And that, that's just the hem of the garment of the passages that tell us God wants to be engaged. God is fully engaged with you. He gave you his word. He sent his son. He says, pray to me. He says, meditate on that word. And so much more. To let us know in so many different ways and so many different, by so many different avenues that we can engage with him because he wants to be engaged with us. I guess the definitive passage in my mind when I think about this idea is the number of times that he comes to Israel and he says this one thing about Israel. And he says it over and over and over. He says, and you will be my people and what? And I shall be your God. See, that's what he desires, right? I'm doing my part. I'm engaging. And he's engaging me. Which leads us kind of to the lament that Christ gave Shortly before the crucifixion, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would have gathered you like a hen gathers his chicks or her chicks, but you would not. He wants to gather us. He wants to be engaged. So God is, yes, 100% engaged with you. Are you engaged with him? So then we challenged our students. What are some ways that you can be engaged with God? And we mentioned some of the things uh, that I've already mentioned. You need to study his word. You need to meditate upon his word. You need to be around his people. But then we went further than that and we talked about, you know, you need to have that quiet time with God. You need to spend hours alone with him. 
thinking about his word and thinking about your life and thinking about how they mess up and examining your heart and your motives and why it is you do what you do. Are we engaged with God was the first question. But then we talked about are we engaged with the church? How can we be engaged with the church? Of course, we explained that the church is the body of Christ. It is the kingdom that he promised. Christ would say, you know, I, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not, or some say hell, shall not prevail against it. In other words, yeah, I'm going to die. I'm going to be put in a grave, but I'm going to rise again and nothing's going to stop this kingdom from being built. He builds that kingdom and in Acts chapter 2, just like the prophecies would say in Joel 2 and in Daniel 2 and all of those passages in the Old Testament, he establishes that church. And for the first time, we're told that God adds people to the church. Based upon what? Well, the first point of connection. Now, we typically say five points of connection, but it really is just kind of one because these things as a whole make the beginning. We hear God's word, Romans 10 and verse 17. Based upon that hearing, now, not just hearing, understanding, knowing what it says, especially, well, especially about our sins. I mean, when they got up on the day of Pentecost, they weren't just giving history. They were leading up to the point where they could say, you killed the Son of God. You're a sinner, is basically what they were saying. And you need to do something about it. And God wanted the message out there to all of those people so badly that he gave those apostles these gifts to speak in tongues or other languages so these guys could hear and they could understand no understanding no hearing no pricking of heart see and that's that whole notion of you know faith convicting us bringing us to repentance and they would cry out you know what do we have to do and of course the apostles would tell them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins, right? And many were baptized that day. Based upon that, they were added to the church. So what did they do? They heard God's word. They believed. They repented of their sins. They confessed the name of Christ. They were baptized for the remission of their sins. Now you can go through all of the gospel, not gospel, go all through the book of Acts, and you can look at every conversion case. And they're worded a little bit differently, but most of the elements are there. The only ones that are emphatically stated every time are hearing the word and baptism. Every time those are mentioned. Now sometimes hearing the word or faith is mentioned and it means all of those other things. But hearing the word and being baptized are mentioned every time. And that's the first step of being engaged with the church. Because upon that obedience, upon our baptism, according to Acts chapter 2, we are added to that body. But that's not the finality of our obligation. We charge the students, the campers, with finding your place in the church. I love the way that Philip put it. Philip stood in our classroom and he looked at all of these kids and he said, you've been told that you are the church of tomorrow. I'm here to tell you you're the church of today. And he really challenged them to step up. And it's because of things like that we have guys coming out of the woodwork asking us, help me do a lesson. Help me understand more. And our young ladies asking more as well. We challenge them to find their place in the church. To look for their talents. Because there is no zero talent individual. And of course we go to the parable of the talents. And we talked about that with them. And we pointed out a couple of points about that. Number one, God gives each and every one of us something to serve within his kingdom. You see, most of these parables that Christ is going to tell that talk about things like talents and, and, and pearls and, and, and all of, you know, mustard seeds and plants, they usually begin with this one phrase. The kingdom of heaven is like. Kingdom of heaven is like. What is he talking about? Well, he's talking about the church, at least in part. At least what you and I know today 
as we make our application to our lives today, that's the framework within which it exists. We are the church. So when he tells the parable of the talents, and he says he gives five and two and one, and this one made five more and this one made two more, but this guy went and kind of buried his and made nothing, there were some interesting observations that were made by our staff and, and by some of the campers. One of the observations was made, <clears throat> one of the observations that was made was that the guy who was condemned because of his inaction was condemned because, well, not condemned because, was condemned for one thing. He had one talent and didn't use it. And the person who made this observation was saying, you know, the guy with five talents then, if he had done something with four, and left one go, then he would have been condemned too. I mean, how many blessings do you have to ignore of God before you get that same judgment leveled against you? How many blessings, how many things that God gives me can I ignore and neglect? How many ways or points of connection that God is trying to make with me can I say, no, don't want that one? before I find the condemnation of God. Just one. So let's say you're a ten-talent person. God expects you to use every single one of those things. Every single one of them. Now, it's not always the easiest thing finding your talent. But we have to do it. And we have to try. We talk to them about giving their money. We talk to them about being peacemakers. We talk to them about being encouragers. We talk to them about all of the different roles that they can have within the church, being leaders. We challenge them that even in the time of their youth, live now so that later on, you become the deacons and the elders and the ministers and all of those people who are serving the church and leading at places like Wiki Watching Christian Camp. So we encourage them to connect, connect with God and connect with the church, and then we encourage them to connect with friends. With friends. And we didn't really just talk to them about being engaged with their Christian friends. We know they love that. And they come to camp and they enjoy that, and the fellowship is great there. But we mainly talked to them about, at least, you know, uh, for the most part, was reaching out to their friends and being a friend. Be the kind of person that folks want to be friends with. The passage we used to talk about this was found in Proverbs chapter 27, and verse 10. It says, Do not forsake your friend or your father's friend, and do not go to your brother's house in the day of your calamity. Better is a neighbor who is near than a brother who is far away. Be a friend. The Bible encourages us to get friends, you have to be a, a friend. And what does it mean to be a friend? Well, we emphasize the Christ's definition of what it means to be a friend. Greater love has what? No man than to lay down his life for his friends. Man, that's a pretty high standard, isn't it? That's a pretty high bar. Now, in the first century, that would have no doubt been a very literal thing. Because... They were living in a time of persecution. Christ is going to leave, and things are just going to get worse. Along comes a guy by the name of Saul, and the Bible tells us that he was wreaking havoc in the church, dragging people out of their homes and, and, and sending them off to be killed, more than likely. It was a time when friends would become important, where families would be divided because of Christ. This is the truth. No, it's not. And sometimes it would mean their lives. Greater love has no man than to lay down his life for his friends. The same thing is applicable to us today. We not, may not be persecuted. Your life might not be threatened simply because you are a child of God today. But that doesn't mean you can't lay down your life for your friends. You can lay down your life in the sense of giving them your time. Being engaged in activities 
together. You know, if you want to be a friend, you've got to do stuff together, right? If you want to foster a relationship, you actually have to, at some point, get together, sit down and, and talk and engage one another. You can pray for your friends. You can teach your friends. You can encourage your friends. And then perhaps the most important thing that you can do to truly be a friend is to teach them the truth of God's Word. And sometimes that's a hard thing. Sometimes we think we're going to lose that friend if we put this religious wall between us. Greater love has no man than to lay down his life. That means your pride and your fears and all of that as well. Be a friend. Be engaged with community. When we talk about community, we kind of explain that idea in the sense that Christ would talk about loving your neighbor as yourself. Those who are your neighbors, that's, that's your community. The people that you can reach for Christ, that is your community. The people that you can serve for him, that is your community. And we as Christians need to be engaged in community. There was at least a couple of different times that Christ would send out his disciples to go and, and do his work. I mean, the Great Commission wasn't the only commission that Christ gave. I mean, it's the one that's given kind of in, at the end of Matthew, and it's sort of the marching orders for the whole of those who name the name of Christ. But prior to that time, he sent others out. There were the time he sent out 70 of his followers. There's another time when he sent out 120, and they were to go through all of these different places teaching about this kingdom that was to come. Christ himself went through all of these different communities, which included those people who were hated by the Jews, the Samaritans. And he would teach them about this kingdom. And he would give them opportunities to act, to be obedient to that truth. You know, we live in a state where, you know, about two-thirds of the vast majority of people that you will meet on the street are what we would call unchurched. That means two-thirds of the state of Florida is just waiting for someone to bring them the message. Now, will they all receive it with great zeal? I was waiting for you. Where have you been? Come on in. Let's have some coffee and biscuits or whatever. You know, no. Some of them are blissfully unaware that they need this message. Some of them are simply having trials and struggles and they don't know what to do. And you just might be the answer. Because you decided that you were going to engage in community and be a good neighbor. And the final thing that we talked about was engaging with family. You know, family is just precious. Family is that divinely, divinely appointed basic unit of all of society. We talked a little bit about fathers this morning, and we certainly could talk a lot about, you know, mothers and the obligations of, you know, children. And we went through many of those things. But the thing that I think we encouraged most about family was no matter what role you play, there are certain principles that should always guide your actions. If you are a child, if you are a father, if you are a mother, there are certainly roles that you're going to have depending uh, on who you are that are very different from the other roles of the people in your household. And with those roles come varying obligations. But there are some basic principles that we can follow in our home that will allow us to constantly and continually be connected with God. Number one, always, always be there for family. Always be there. Like we mentioned this morning, fathers are to provide for their own. But providing is simply not enough. You know, if your father gives you you know, it was simply the guy who sent money, but it was never there. Does that go over real well? Is that something that people desire? Well, you know, dad was never there, but man, he sent his money. That's not desirable. Be there. Fathers, be there for your children. Mothers, be there for your children. Children, help your parents out. Down to the practical level of clean your room. 
and know that you are part of a family and all the family needs to help. Express warmth. Number two, express warmth, affection, and encouragement at all times. Now, there are plenty of things that work against that idea. Harsh words. Sternness. Angry words. Poor attitudes. Inaction. And anything really that falls short of love kind of opposes those ideas. Build healthy values and morals. Communicate. Play together. Remember, and I really like this one. Remember that the best things in life are not things at all. The best things in life are not things at all. One of the best things that I've ever experienced has been standing in a foreign country with my children, watching the sun go down in our face and at our back is a house that we built together for some family that we've never met, all in the name of Christ. It's precious. And I don't think I can ever really put words to how that makes you feel. I can try. But the dearest things in life are not things at all. It's not the money. It's not the house. It's not the car. It's not that device. It's not a thing. Knowing that I have a relationship with God and knowing that I'm leading my family toward that deeper relationship and engagement with God. That's what our week was all about. And that's one of those intangible ideas that should impact our families deeply. We should impact our community deeply. We should impact our friends deeply. Impact our church deeply and impact our relationship with God. So the question that we asked up there is the same question we ask here. Are you engaged? More specifically, are you fully engaged? One of the things that I took off of the, the, the book before I printed them, and, and it, I wish I'd have left it on, but I did it to kind of save paper, was a little definition of the word engaged. Now some of you have the early printing of the notes and you have this. I just want to read you kind of this definition, and I've inserted a few things. Engaged, and this is straight from the, di the dictionary. It says, busy or occupied with his work. Second definition was pledged to Christ and his church. Third definition of engaged is interlocked with God and family and community. And the final definition from the dictionary was in gear with one another. So are we engaged? Are you fully engaged? Well, if you're not, then tonight's the night that you should take that first step. Go into those waters of baptism. Rise to walk in newness of life. Maybe you just simply need to get back on track. Maybe you just have struggles in your heart that are distracting you. Let Christian brothers and sisters help. Let them lift you up. Let them hold you when you're weak. If you're here tonight and you're subject to the invitation's call in any way, let it be known as together we stand and sing.